I firstly just wanted to uh, make a few remarks about the symposium. Uh, the Law Technology and the Arts Centre was started here at 2000, in 2001, and the founding director was Professor Craig Nard. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He's, he has the ill fortune to be in Barcelona, enjoying himself and preparing for his European sabbatical next semester. But he started the, the uh, LTA Centre. He set up a number of programs to prepare our students for leadership roles in careers in law, technology and the arts. And we have a number of programs here to achieve that. We have a concentration in law and technology, concentration in law and the arts, both for our JD and our LLM students. We have a number of uh, lunchtime colloquia. We have our annual symposium. And this year's annual symposium, as you all know, is on the 10th anniversary of the WIPO copyright treaties. And I'm very excited to have this tremendous list, this tremendous group of speakers here today who have literally flown in from the four corners of the globe. We have people from many different countries who are going to talk about the treaties and their impact on um, their countries, on other countries, on harmonising copyright law generally, particularly in the digital age. Um, I should say a few thank yous other to the speakers themselves for, for gathering here today. Uh, firstly, I really wanted to thank our immediate past dean, Jerry Korngold, who a lot of you know. He was really the inspiration behind the LTA Centre. He was really the person who uh, supported that and put it together. I must thank Professor Nard, who really has spent the last five years building the centre into what it is today with all these very exciting programs and speakers. And, um, you know, we have a, a large contingent of our students who are involved in all of our programs. Um, I very much need to thank uh, Alice Simon and Nancy Pratt, who most of you have seen floating around outside this morning. They have managed to get all of these people here in a hotel room, get them fed, um, and have generally done a wonderful job. So uh, although they're not here, I very much want to thank them for that. Additionally, I really want to thank the Law Review students, and in particular, Elizabeth LeBlanc, the editor of the Case Law Review. Uh, they are publishing the symposium, as they always do. That will be forthcoming next year. Uh, they will be helping today in terms of timekeeping and microphone running for Q&A, and they do a terrific job, and I'd very much like to thank them. I also very much want to thank, and you'll hear from him in a a second, my colleague Professor Michael Scharf, who is extremely busy, as many of you know, and uh, has kindly offered to co-sponsor the symposium with the LTA Centre, has kindly offered to be here and to be uh, involved in the symposium despite all of his other commitments, so I'm very happy uh, that he can be with us today. And I also want to thank, and I believe he'll be here in a minute, our new Dean, who just started in July, uh, Dean Gary Simpson, who has taken over from Dean Korngold, has done a really terrific job in keeping the centres together and the direction of the school the same, and uh, we can continue to have these symposia and continue with the, um, you know, the great work that Professor Nard and Professor Scharf have done over the years. The program today will be divided into a keynote presentation by Professor Akedaji from Minnesota, we will then have three panels that look at different aspects of the WIPO Treaty. So the first panel at 11 o'clock will be a policy panel that talks about some of the uh, drafting issues behind the treaties and some of the general policy impacts of those treaties in domestic legislation. The second panel will look specifically at the uh, digital rights management aspect of the treaties and how that has played out in... Um, various countries around the world. And the third panel will look specifically at the issue of database protection legislation and uh, what has occurred in relation to that in the last eight to 10 years. Uh, each panel will have a keynote speaker and then a number of commentators and or shorter papers. So I think we'll have a really interesting range of views on, on all of those issues. I believe we're being webcast, so if you miss any panels, you can... Um, you can certainly look them up on our, our website later on. 
And I think uh, with that, I've probably thanked everyone and that's probably all I have to say. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Shaft, to talk a little bit about uh, the work of the Cox Centre and then to introduce our Dean and our keynote speaker. Thanks, Michael. If we time this right, just when I get to the introduction of, this, of the Dean, he will be walking in because we understand he's on his way. So um, if not, uh, I guess we'll do what they call Phil, right? Yeah. So, um, well, you could just call me money bags. I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the, the director of the Frederick Cox International Law Center. And 15 years ago, this center, well before I arrived here, I, I've only been teaching here for the last five years. I used to teach in Boston. And before that, I worked at the State Department. But 15 years ago, the Gunn Foundation generously endowed the center with over $2.5 million in endowment money. And over the 15 years, the international law program has grown and grown and grown. And we do things with the other centers, including this conference. And so when I said money bags, I was quite literal. Um, because uh, one of the nice contributions we've been able to make today is to help get the speakers here from the four corners of the world um, and put you up at the Glidden House and feed you all and, and all the other good things that we do for our conferences. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Cox Center while we're waiting for the Dean to arrive. In addition to uh, it growing over the years, um, it has had an effect on both the faculty and the student body here. Currently, 50%, half of our faculty members, will dabble in teaching some international law courses. Some of them teach full-time in the international law program. We also have a summer abroad program, and many of our faculty have been teaching international elements of their domestic law courses, like if they taught tax law this summer, Craig Boys will be teaching international tax law at our summer abroad program. So it's really exciting to be a law school where so many of our faculty are teaching in the inter international arena. That has translated also to our student body. And in the last three years, we have had surveys of our entering students. Uh, three years ago, 40% said they were coming to the law school because of international law and international law related activities. Uh, two years ago, it was 50%. This year, it was 60%. So it's having a huge impact in our ability to recruit. Many of these students are saying that they're selecting case over um, other schools that are higher ranked in the hierarchy because of our specialty programs, including law, technology, and the art, and international law. Um, one of the things we do with our money, in addition to sponsoring annual conf several annual conferences a year, annual debate series, uh, annual lecture series, is we send our students out to the four corners of the world in the summer where they do internships and we give them money to make this possible. So hopefully we'll have students working at the World Intellectual Property Organization soon or for any of the associated organizations that, are, um, that some of you are representing today. Uh, it's an area that I'm really excited about having our students get involved in. We also have very unique experiential learning programs. We have something called the War Crimes Research Office and program. And um, what that does is it provides research assistance to five international tribunals. We also have a counterterrorism lab that provides uh, research assistance to the military commissions and is helping to reform those, to bring those up to the standards of the Geneva Conventions. We have an IMF and World Bank lab that does work with the international financial organizations. And our newest lab is the US Coast Guard International Law Lab. And so one of the really exciting things we have going on here is that a good large portion of our students students are getting hands-on experience in the international field. And the timing did work out just right because joining us just now um, is the dean of our law school. Let me tell you a little bit about him and then introduce him and he will introduce our keynote speaker. Um, dean Gary Simpson has just joined our law school this summer. We're really excited that he is with us. He's a graduate of both Yale undergrad and Yale law school. He did his federal judicial clerkship on the Second Circuit. He was an editor of the prestigious Yale Law Review. Um, he is not just uh, an expert at constitutional law and other areas, but for purposes of this conference, um, he's also one of the leading experts at conflict of laws. And his conflict of laws casebook is now in its fourth edition. And so when he is involved in a conference like this, he's not just here as a representative of the university, but also one of the foremost experts in the area. We're really happy to have you here, Dean. Now that was probably an inf you give you an inflated sense of me before I get up here, uh, but I'm uh, delighted to be here. I think this is a 
This is a wonderful conference, um, and I congratulate the organizers on putting it together. Uh, I'm going to introduce the keynote speaker, uh, Ruth Okadiji, uh, who is the William Prosser Professor of Law uh, at the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, she joined the Minnesota faculty in 2002, uh, had taught for a number of years at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, her scholarship focuses principally on international intellectual property issues, uh, with particular attention to the relationship between multilateral trade law uh, and intellectual property policy. Her work has addressed the relationship between developing and developed countries uh, in the international intellectual property system. Uh, she's written, lectured, and published extensively uh, in the area of in international intellectual property regulation and harmonization, and she's the co-author uh, of the very well-known casebook, Copyright in a Global Information Economy. She served as a consultant with various in international organizations, uh, including the UN Developments Program uh, Project on Innovation, Culture, Biogenetic Resources, uh, and Traditional Knowledge. Uh, aside from intellectual property, she's taught employment law and international trade. She's earned numerous teaching awards, citations, and held, employments, held appointments in public service. Uh, for the Association of American Law Schools, she has chaired the section of law and computers, uh, as well as the section on intellectual property. She's held various visiting research positions at Harvard Law School, uh, the Max Planck Institute for International and Comparative Patent, Copyright, Trademark, and Unfair Competition Law uh, in Munich, Germany. Uh, her LLB came in 1989 uh, from the University of, I'm going to probably mispronounce this, Jos, J-O-S, uh, in, it's, it's in Nigeria. Uh, she also has degrees LLM and JSD uh, from Harvard Law School in 1991 and 1996, uh, and she's going to be speaking today on copyrights compromise. Uh, so I introduce Prof Professor Okadiji to you. Thank you. I want to thank the Dean for uh, that gracious introduction. I was struck actually as he uh, was reading that um, by how inaccurate um, that representation now is given the changes uh, that we're going to be talking about for much of today. That uh, there probably isn't going to be for much longer anything called intellectual property. Uh, we'll probably be talking about contracts and uh, computer code instead. Um, I'm not sure it's international, uh, probably more accurately described as U.S. or Western European. Um, and I'm certainly not sure that it's about trade. So uh, I think one of the challenges that we have as scholars in this area is the responsibility both to analyze what is happening substantively in our subject area, but also what is happening structurally um, in the larger context of, of global economic um, arrangements. My comments today are, are going to focus on um, really what I see as a shift uh, in um, international intellectual property law, um, but it's a shift that I suggest um, is in a different direction than what we have currently um, assumed it to be. I think the copyright's relationship to technology as a matter of first instance is no longer neutral. And there are those that might suggest that it's always never been neutral. Uh, the copyright is a product of uh, technology and has always responded to technological change. And while I think that that is in fact the case, it is also true that in a world of digital technology, it is no longer that copyright is responding to technology, but the copyright is uh, very quickly perhaps becoming less relevant to technology. So its relationship to technology, I would argue is no longer just neutral or passive, but indeed um, we may have had a moment of relevance that very quickly got usurped um, with the digital era. 
The second um, uh, point that I think uh, uh, is important to, to, to make up front um, is that copyright law is no longer just about structuring the relationship between um, authors and users. Indeed, uh, it is probably more true to say that copyright law um, is more the concern of manufacturers of, of digital technology whose use of the law's grant of exclusive privileges to authors has spurred a new sort of technological race, a comment that I think, or an observation that others have made. And I think the third sort of introductory point would be that copyright um, is really no longer about creativity. And this is a point that um, we've always suspected, I think, in the literature, and scholars have made this argument in various ways and in different dimensions. Um, but the fact is that in a digital environment, we now assume that creativity will happen. Now, that is in part the function of very low originality standards. Um, that is in part the function of having very weak moral rights uh, globally outside of continental Europe. Um, but in the literature and even in our discussion today about the WIPO Internet Treaties, cr the question of creativity um, is really no longer a central organizing theme um, in our discipline. And, and I think that that has some fairly interesting implications for authorship um, and um, for notions of who is a consumer. Uh, Professor Joe Liu is here um, in, a, in a very, I think, provocative article some years back. He, he talked about copyright's view um, of the user and this notion that users were sort of passive, um, inactive, unengaged, non-creative um, groups of people that simply interacted with copyright rather than being a part of the copyright uh, regime itself. And I think that that, that uh, a theme, and that thesis uh, certainly bears um, uh, repetition and, and, in fact, some highlighting today as we talk about uh, the digital um, situation. So I'm going to be speaking about what I call copyrights compromise um, or a copyright scholar's uh, last-ditch plea um, that if anybody recognizes copyright, um, would that person please stand up? Or more appropriately, would copyright please stand up? Um, I want to thank, uh, before I launch into, into the substance of my speech, Jackie Lipton for the invitation um, and really for the privilege of speaking at this conference um, to the dean for hosting us, um, because I think that rather than look at this as an opportunity to pontificate about um, the recent developments that have had us all very disturbed, it is a very important opportunity to reflect on uh, 10 years of a copyright's embrace of the digital revolution. And it, given the pace at which copyright law is developing or has developed over the last decade, um, this moment of pause is fairly important. Uh, rarely do we as scholars, as practitioners, as policymakers in this field have the opportunity to sort of stop and reflect um, on how the discipline has been affected or changed or transformed by uh, international uh, events and most importantly by uh, technological events. Now, reflection at this juncture in the life of the treaties is particularly meaningful, not only because I think a decade is enough time to uh, accumulate experience and to evaluate the impact and the relative effect of the treaties on copyright's domain, but also because the treaties are very likely going to redirect the future of content regulation in ways that we did not imagine um, at the genesis um, of the uh, treaties. Um, so I want to talk about the WIPO treaties in, in three ways. First, I want to examine the theoretical underpinnings um, that justify the supply of new forms of protection that we see in the WIPO Internet Treaties. Um, I focus on this uh, in my remarks because I think that overall we are sufficiently familiar with the technological developments that gave rise to the demand for content protection, but we perhaps have not focused as much on how those demands uh, are consistent or otherwise with the very core um, of why copyright um, exists. Second, in my comments, I want to briefly reflect on how the treaties have been adapted, implemented, and evaluated over the last decade. Um, the panels, I'm sure, later this afternoon will talk about these more in depth, but what I would like to do is draw some conclusions and offer some limited insights into what the ratification and adoption process does not mean 
right? What does it not mean? Um, and how it might point us to reconsider more carefully the role of treaties as a source of substantive global copyright norms. Um, and here I'm going to comment a little bit on the WIPO Broadcasting Treaty in particular. Um, and then finally, I want to focus on, on, on the irrelevance of copyright norms to the development of digital copyright and the failure of copyright to exert any meaningful doctrinal force um, in shaping creativity, um, in encouraging dissemination in the digital age. And it is this that I refer to as um, copyrights compromise. Now, formally, the digital treaties added new rights to the global scene. So, for example, we see the right of distribution that did not otherwise exist in the Berne Convention being very carefully articulated um, in the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Um, it added new ways to protect uh, copyrighted works so that we saw a shift from simply rules of property that said you could not um, interfere with the exclusive rights of the copyright owner um, to technological protection measures which will be uh, a large focus, I think, of the panel um, after my talk. Um, and the, for the first time in the history of international copyright, we see in these treaties an explicit limit on users. If you look at the Berne Convention and even the TRIPS Agreement, which was fairly radical for its time and day, um, none of those two treaties um, really addressed users directly. None of those treaties talked about users. Um, what you will find uh, the closest is this reference to the public and, and the ability of nation states to enact limitations and exceptions um, in the public interest um, or regulating perhaps the dissemination of works of the public. But you never saw an explicit reference to users. And it was striking um, to look um, at Article 11 of the WCT and to, to look at how for the first time in the history of international copyright users are addressed directly in an international copyright agreement. And of course, it's not to identify users as part necessarily of the creative process and as part of the dissemination uh, process um, that copyright uh, law ties, tries to regulate, but instead it was to say users cannot do certain things. The countries had an obligation to make sure that users did not, in fact, engage in certain kinds of behavior. Um, and so you see Article 12 of the WCT on rights management speaking about actions against persons. And uh, in the literature about TRIPS, uh, one of the comments that we've made, um, scholars have made throughout, has been TRIPS really intruded in the national sphere by telling governments not only that these kinds of activities by uh, uh, users were wrong, but, but prescribing remedies and the sorts of judicial processes that countries had to adopt in order to, in fact, protect um, um, the rights secured by TRIPS. So that was a remarkable intrusion into the national jurisdiction of member states to the WTO. What we did not see, or what we're seeing in the WCT, is a step further, where an international treaty is not only addressing national governments, but is addressing what users as individuals may or may not do. Again, I think something that was overlooked, but quite significant in the jurisprudence of international um, intellectual property. So why did the emergence of digital technology and network systems um, for the distribution of content require new legal uh, methods of protection? Uh, what has become famously clear in the last 10 years is that um, the law, copyright law in particular, has been less necessary for owners of content than the ability to uh, secure that content technologically. So what was the function of the law um, in this regard? Regard. Now, the familiar story, of course, is the digital technology altered a carefully uh, negotiated balance between owners and users by compromising the ability of owners to control the use and disposition of their work. New technologies, um, in, in the words of, of, of one scholar, sort of radically reshaped the pie, um, not just granting bigger and bigger slices to users, but in fact shrunk the sizes um, that were available both to the public and to owners. 
owners. Um, and so there was an outcry that the effect of digital technology would be to alter this balance by also creating disincentives for authors, right? Authors um, losing out um, economically, losing out on their ability to control the use and the dissemination of their works um, would somehow have their incentive base eroded. And this familiar story, of course, is what we start every copyright law class with. That copyright uh, is an example of a public good. In the absence of um, a copyright laws, we would find that there would be no incentive to create because there'd be no ability or limited ability to recoup um, the costs or, in fact, to uh, gain um, economically from the creative process. And so in the digital revolution, this story was, was, was fairly consistent and, and seemed to sit very nicely within the framework of copyright. Um, and so the notion behind the WCT and the WPPT, which by the way had really been in the works right as the TRIPS agreement was also being negotiated, um, the, the story was that we needed to have new rights or at least new ways of reconceptualizing rights and benefits the copyright owners were entitled to because of the way in which digital technology had empowered users um, to circumvent uh, legal boundaries um, from the print and from the ink and paper age. Um, and in the ensuing years of the Wiper Internet Treaties, there has indeed been what Pam Samuelson refers to as the copyright grab, no question about it. Um, but this grab has not been by, you know, users who uh, in a world of uh, pixels and um, bytes or uh, unregulated, but the grab has been by owners whose vulnerability to these audacious users um, entitled them to not only preserve what was a status quo relationship in the non-digital age, but in fact entitled them to ask for more and to get more through technology. Digital copyright, it was argued, was necessary simply to preserve the ability of owners to do this. Now, it's interesting that the preamble to the WCT states, for example, along with this popular story, that the desire of the contracting parties is to maintain the protection of rights of authors in their literary and artistic works in a manner as effective and uniform as possible. And that the introduction of the new international rules introduced by the WIPO Copyright Treaty in particular was simply to clarify the interpretation of existing rules, right? So this is sort of a, a, a freezer story, right? We just want to preserve, we want to maintain um, existing rules, preserve status quo um, in order to provide adequate solutions solutions to the questions raised by new economic, social, cultural, and technological developments. And you see similar language in the WPPT. Um, and instead of this preservation, as I might have alluded to, both the WCT and the WPPT uh, radically did more than just transfer a balance to the digital environment. First of all, we know as copyright scholars, as intellectual property scholars, that the balance to which we refer um, this nuanced relationship between owners and users um, is not a static balance. That it has been a balance that has been calibrated carefully through institutions that determine protection or lack thereof. For example, even though in the US and, and certainly under the burn, we don't have a formality system, um, there is still a threshold requirement for originality. And when a case gets to a court, there is still the question that has to be answered, does this work meet the basic requirements of copyrightability? And so this nuance, this relationship between owners and <laughs> users has always been calibrated, calibrated by institutions to help us determine whether or not the, the minimum criteria of copyrightability has been met, calibrated by decisions, um, either through statute or again through courts, to determine when a, a appropriate permissible uses or exceptions to these works were um, justified, calibrated by time that after a certain period of time, um, it would be in fact legitimate for this work to fall into the public domain and for secondary users um, and, and future creators uh, to have access, unimpeded, unfettered access to that. So that this famous balance, 
was not one that could be easily transferred into the digital environment without attention to some of the public principles, doctrinal uh, boundaries that had been established both by case law, by precedent, by historical experience, and certainly by the legislature. Most commentators would agree that these treaties, not the way they were implemented, which I'll get to in a moment, but that these treaties reframed the relationship between owners and users um, and created what I'm referring to in, in, in my paper as a polygamous web of interactions or linkages, alliances uh, between not only content providers and users now, but uh, individuals and, and entities as far off as manufacturers of hardware, including garage door openers and inkjet cartridge uh, manufacturers, relationships with online service providers, and possibly any person out there that had a technological uh, claim to control uh, content given, again, our very low level of originality. Thus, this one-dimensional or binary relationship that undergird much of copyright's architecture um, has really been disturbed by the introduction of new and strange actors bringing along both new pressures and norms to bear upon a system that I think most of us would agree has already been stretched very, very thin. The major justification for copyright incentives for protection was so, as I said, upset quite fabulously um, and it got lots of attention early on in the life of the treaties um, and that has since faded in light of the outrage about the scope of the implementation of these treaties, particularly in the United States and in the European Union. The digital treaties successfully replaced originality with control and even though our originality standards were very, very low, um, they still, as the Supreme Court told us in Feist, still existed, um, and I would argue that the digital treaties have very successfully uh, moved originality um, into simply uh, a, a sort of a fig leaf um, and replaced its substance with control, and it has legitimized the case um, for more control in order, allegedly, to preserve um, whatever this new form of creativity is. Now, this is a dialectic that's fraught with a lot of tension, and I don't have time to explore it this morning, but the issue being that control and not creativity or originality um, now appears to be the core of our copyright system. Controls over content, then, were directly linked to the justification for copyright in our very distinct utilitarian system. And I find this ironic, that when you look at the TRIPS agreement and you look at the WIPO Internet treaties, it would appear that utilitarianism is Trump, has trumped, right? That in the not-so-epic battle between continental d'autor systems and our utilitarian system in the United States, which basically looks at intellectual property as a means to further legitimate end, um, that this would be a good thing on the international scene. And in fact, what we see is a subversion of utilitarianism um, and indeed the heightened status of not authors necessarily, but authors, uh, owners qua um, authors. So deep, digging deeper, it seems utterly dysfunctional that a global treaty, which uh, is a form of public law, would in essence reorder relations between the state and the global on the one hand, and on the other hand, also constrain the very picture um, of private acts being insulated from public law's reach. So the copyright law as a form of public law, both nationally and internationally, uh, now through the veil of the WIPO Internet Treaties, um, has the legitimate capacity um, and right, some would say, to, to uncover and, and determine and shape uh, private uses of content um, in very private spaces. When we stop to think about it carefully, the WIPO treaties are, are likely the most effective penetration of, of the global into the national and local, um, and of course, as I said just now, into the sphere of the personal as well. At the heart of the justifications for new forms of protection, the issue was not at all the preservation of a balance, but who would control the surplus generated by new technology. In copyright originalism, the answer would have always been the public, right? The surplus goes to the public. At the very least, the government got to decide how to divide that surplus, but no longer. <laughs> 
Today, in copyrights, digital enlightenment, it, the government doesn't even seem to have a role to play. And this should be troubling in light of, of what Neil Netanel would refer to as copyrights democratic function or social functions more generally. What we see are digital levers to control or manipulate uses of content, reinforced by artificial boundaries between users and owners, the governed and those who govern, and all the while constraining the doctrinal space within copyright um, for norms of openness, norms of dissemination, norms of cultural interchange, and yes, even para copyright norms, or some would say they are part of copyright, but norms that govern privacy and speech. So how have these treaties fared? Today there are 60 contracting parties to the WCT. Um, it's actually only enforced in about half, a little more than half of those countries. Um, but what is really ironic is that of these uh, 45 to 50 countries where there's actually activity about the WIPO digital uh, uh, treaties, 25 of them are developing countries or least developed countries. The same statistics are fairly true for the WPPT, um, with more than half of the membership um, of the contracting parties being developing countries and least developed countries. Now, what is ironic, of course, um, is that pursuant to the Doha Declaration, uh, these least developing countries um, have a seven and a half year extension of the TRIPS implementation. So a total of 32 countries, of which about a third of them are members of the WIPO Digital Treaties um, and have ratified uh, these treaties. Um, that has an interesting pathology we'll get to later, and maybe in Q&A, but about half of them don't even have an obligation to implement the TRIPS agreement. Now if you look at the structure of the TRIPS agreement and the WIPO Digital Treaties, what you will find obviously is that those digital treaties in fact build upon the TRIPS agreement. So what you get in countries countries say like Benin, for example, or Burkina Faso, some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, what you see are these really strange, very technologically sophisticated, crafted national implementations of the WIPO Copyright Treaty um, in countries in which about 85% of the population has no internet access and in which about 65% of the population has never even visited a cyber cafe. Implementation of these treaties is a WIPO priority and part of the uh, uh, technical um, uh, aid given to developing countries and to least developing countries has been how to successfully and appropriately implement the digital treaties. In countries where, as I mentioned, not only is the hardware and the, and the uh, basic technology missing, but in fact, in many of these least developed countries in particular, about a good 25 to 30% of the population cannot read. Now, there are quite a number of things going on with the implementation of the uh, WIPO um, uh, digital treaties, and I want to mention a few of them very quickly um, before I move on to the third theme of my talk. And, and that is to start off by saying, first of all, that the nature of the technology that has given rise to this great shift in copyright, in copyright's architecture, has been in part a move towards legal harmonization. And the outcome of legal harmonization um, would, would, one would think, be fairly predictable. If you have standard legal rules and you have sufficient adoption of those rules nationally, and where it is technologically driven, you would assume that what you would get is pure harmonization. People implementing in quite the same way, doing quite the same things, um, um, uh, especially, as I said, with WIPO's assistance, given that it is a priority. Um, in WIPO's um, program of implementation, oh, a work program, excuse me. Um, but what has become clear from the way these have been implemented is that law is not enough to deal with the problems that content owners are facing with digital technology. And what you're seeing in many developed countries, the US, the EU um, as a whole, is the move now, notwithstanding the strength of the WIPO digital treaties, a move from law uh, to contract, a move from copyright law to contract. In most countries that have adopted the WCT, there has been sufficient legal protection and legal remedies 
provided against the circumvention of effective technological measures um, so that there has been, in fact, a real ratification of the WCT and WPPT. But what you find is that amongst these countries, there's a wide diversity in areas such as should such violations be punished by civil or criminal uh, penalties, right? Uh, what kind of exceptions and limitations should be available? Should this be part of a copyright case, a, a copyright violation claim, infringement claim, or should it be dealt with under the rubric of unfair competition or some other sort of tort? And what you're finding, even in the developed countries, is wide variation in the capacity of these countries to think about how copyright law is, in fact, most meaningfully preserved in light of the obligations um, imposed by the uh, WIPO copyright and WIPO WIPO Performance of Phonograms Treaty, um, the digital treaties. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that businesses are, are very much involved in the work of these treaties and in thinking about how best to implement these treaties, and they have become the target for the most part of experimentation, certainly in the developed countries, um, about technological protection measures in particular. Um, you'll find in a recent 2006 uh, publication by WIPO um, a caution to businesses stating, and I quote, Businesses need to use care when making commercial use of works protected by TPMs. Because if this would require circumventing the TPM, this is now an action that is prohibited by law. Now, it doesn't say that it's WIPO's law that is prohibited this, but this is an action that is now prohibited by law. And liability for violating a TPM is separate and distinct from liability for violating the copyright work. This means that even if circumvention is authorized, even if you have legal permission to circumvent this effective technological measure, the regular rules of copyright infringement still apply. Thus, any exploitation of a work would require not one, but two licenses, a license to circumvent and a license to use. Now, we should all be troubled by the extra layer of tax that has now been added uh, through the, or through the, under the auspices of the WIPO digital uh, uh, treaties um, to our use of content, and to, in particular, our use of content that may not even be subject to copyright protection. And one of the radical shifts that you see in the purview, in the survey of implementation of the WIPO copyright treaties is a lot of dissonance, not only in what is a viable copyright norm in the digital context, but in how best, on how best that norm might be implemented in a digital environment. I call it in the paper, really a shift, not just from law to technology, but a shift in many ways from who the institutions or what institutions are best suited to make decisions about copyrights, regular copyrights, uh, doctrinal um, scope. Users, in addition to trying to determine if and when they can circumvent for things such as fair use, for things such as legitimate uh, interoperability requirements, um, are now also going to have to decide if the work is original. It's a shift and a use of public law to privatize decision making on the part of private individuals, but with no real guidance in the law as to what constitutes a regular or uh, an allowable use. So that if there was a chilling effect in areas like fair use, for example, where US scholars have, for example, said over and over again, one of the problems with fair use is its indeterminacy. The ex post costs of error are so high that most users are unlikely to want to use a work um, and call it fair use, right? There's always going to be a sense, I should get permission, even if the law says I can have it. Well, if that's been our history and our experience with fair use, imagine how that anxiety and that chilling effect is enhanced significantly when there's an extra layer of rights that must be cut through before you get to use of the work, and there's an extra layer of penalties associated with 
that work. And so one of the things that a few countries, Sweden, for example, has done um, in its legislation is to make it very clear that if you access the work to make a copy for personal use, you will, in fact, not be liable um, under copyright law. But most, most legislation implementing the treaties has failed to uh, uh, provide for that level of specificity um, for users. And so users, in effect, are being written out of copyrights architecture. A very troubling outcome, um, but troubling not just because uh, of what the literature says, that it will cost more to use, but that it will cost more to use and the costs are almost entirely borne by users themselves. The cost of determining the legitimacy of the use, the legitimacy of the effective technological measure, the cost of determining what is copyrightable, what is not copyrightable, does this fall within an exception, does this not fall within an exception, on and on and on. It is no wonder then that in the popular resistance to the national implementations of the WIPO digital treaties, what we have seen is a shift not to copyright exceptions and limitations, which historically pressure has always driven users to, to utilize these, but instead a shift to external bodies of law, consumer protection law, a shift to contract doctrines such as unconscionability, to limit the power of the copyright owner to completely monopolize and regulate the user's ability to access the work. Now, the reality, of course, and in, 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 in light of, of countries like Japan that has really harsh penalties for circumvention, the reality is that the shift to, DR, to, to consumer uh, uh, protection laws, to other sort of tort claims, unfair competition laws, uh, the shift perhaps even to, to contract doctrines such as unconscionability and public policy have not really been successful. And this is particularly so in the European Union context. Um, consumer protection uh, uh, claims um, have had limited success in the United States, um, even more limited success in the European context, um, and it does not appear that moving from copyright linked limitations and exceptions for the public interest and shifting the pressure to non-copyright regimes is going to be a very successful process um, in, the years, in the years ahead. While there is a lot of NGO and developing country backlash to the uh, treaties, the fact of the matter is that WIPO has remained unmoved, fairly um, entrenched in its preservation of the position that these treaties are necessary um, for copyright. Of course, there's then following the DMCA and uh, the European um, uh, stance on the importance of the WIPO digital treaties, the move we see, not just that these treaties in and of themselves um, are there, but that the move towards bilateral treaties that almost verbatim mirror the language of U.S. national um, um, implementation of the WIPO digital treaties has consolidated in the last five years. So that even if we were to go to WIPO, and even if WIPO were to have a change of orientation in respect to the balance and the interest of copyright in recalibrating the system in a way that gives room for creativity, in a way that gives room for dissemination, in a way that makes second generation creators um, more plausibly, um, um, have more plausible access to content, um, that outcome is likely to be severely constrained given the popularity of bilateral and regional trade agreements to incorporate uh, literally the language of the DMCA. So despite differences in methodology of implementation and dif despite differences in scope and despite differences in approach, we have a non-harmonized implementation of the WIPO digital treaties, but that non-harmonization has not produced the surplus that is typically the case when you have a global arrangement that is designed, in essence, to encourage states to, 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 to balance the interests of copyright authors and copyright users. In conclusion, I think it's important to note that when the WIPO copyright treaties were negotiated 10 years ago, um, Pamela Samuelson has a wonderful article detailing the history of the negotiations um, and the actual state of play in WIPO during the negotiation um, process. And at the beginning of this process, copyright was the focus. 
there was a genuine concern that this was a question about copyright creativity and authorship and owners and users and about preserving the integrity of the copyright system um, both to generate incentives and generate economic gain for creators, but also to ensure that the public access to such works would not be unduly constrained, and in particular, to ensure that there would be a surplus for the public uh, to participate in. What I think has become clear is that copyright as an, organi as an organizing principle to induce creativity is not really the question anymore. And I think 10 years of these treaties have proven that to us. That instead, copyright has become an organizing principle for the generation of new technologies to aid, I think, the objective of ensuring that access is um, both constrained, not necessarily for, for pernicious reasons, but in order to gain that surplus and to recapture it um, on behalf of private rights owners. What is the most startling outcome in my mind is that this has resulted in a copyright system that is, again, not about content, not about owners, not about users, but most importantly, it has enthroned the manufacturers of hardware, the manufacturers of technology as the real beneficiaries of copyright law. In my view, uh, TPMs, uh, technological protection systems, um, the fact that under the WIPO Broadcasting Treaty, we are now have new beneficiaries, broadcasting organizations. Um, all of these changes that we see in the international copyright system, that we are seeing in national copyright systems, um, will certainly outlast copyright as a doctrinal matter, I think. However, we have not seen the last story written with pen and paper. Notwithstanding then, <coughs> the great spread of technology, the great spread of digital networks, and the important ways in which digital technology has in fact impacted copyright's central design. The real question is can we restore the soul of copyright law after its great compromise? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't go anywhere, okay. Sorry, I just have to say this into the microphone because we are recording. Um, we have plenty of time for, for Q&A now, um, but because we are recording, we have some of the law review students with microphones, so if you can direct your questions into the mics for Professor Ekedeji, and uh, you know there may be a few waits while the mics... Oh, there's the other mic. Okay, we're good. So any uh, questions, feel free. Okay, I'm going to exercise the uh, symposium chair's privilege of asking the first question. And uh, my question is, you talked about the, the shift from originality to control um, with respect to digital works, and you probably can guess what, what my view is, but I would be interested in your thoughts on the Lexmark appeal and whether that helps uh, with respect to adding some more common sense to the notion of originality or whether really that hasn't helped at all. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I think that one of the, the things we have to be concerned about um, is that if it, if it takes a court to tell users, um, um, even, you know, users that, that weren't thinking about copyright at the time they engaged in the interaction with the, 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 with the technology control at issue, if it takes a court to tell us when in fact a work is sufficiently original or when in fact it is okay to engage um, with a work that has been uh, protected by, a, by an effective technological measure, um, that we're probably worse off, not better off, notwithstanding sort of a restoration of some sort of doctrinally sound uh, basis um, for the decision as I think uh, Alex Smart suggests. Um, and the reason for this is actually not a copyright reason. The reason for this is that most of you, um, most of us, we're all users and authors and creators, most of us are not likely to um, be willing to take a risk if we think that it will take a court to vindicate this. Now the costs of litigation, the costs of, of dealing with lawyers, uh, legal fees, et cetera, are enough to scare um, most 
the average user away. But even as scholars, how many times um, have we, as scholars in, in our own writing, had to get permission to utilize works? Um, and the amount of time and effort and energy that it takes has been unbelievably um, um, sort of time consuming. So part of, uh, part of the concern, I think, in replacing control with creativity is because the, the stakes have always been so high for users who violate copyright and been so low for owners who overreach their copyright that until that balance is restored, we're going to find that even if the purity of copyright doctrine is preserved, um, users are going to be sufficiently chilled um, by the, um, I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, German R-I-I-R-I-A-A -A -A, um, a video clip where a mom and two kids go to um, are singing happy birthday. Um, and you see a brick wall and, and um, the little girl says to her mom, you know, how, you know, how many more times are we going to, when is daddy gonna come home? And the mom says, oh, you have to sing happy birthday five more times. And, um, and then you see, you know, five years imprisonment for illegal download of music. Um, and, you know, now you see that on TV three or four times, that's enough to tell a, a, a parent, a mother. I mean, even if you don't know anything about copyright, you could go to the library the next day and want to photocopy a book and not be sure just because the way the popular culture sort of um, disseminates that kind of knowledge, that kind of information, that kind of overreaching. So I think until we recalibrate that balance, until we say there are penalties for overreaching and there may be penalties for copyright infringement as there are, you're going to find far less willingness to take the risk, even if our doctrinal uh, sort of um, um, balance is restored. And, and that to me is perhaps more the problem um, than anything else. And, and the Lexmark decision I think was helpful and I think it will, you know, uh, ultimately um, gives us a sense that there is there's some hope somewhere but um, I'm not sure that that sort of drop in the vast ocean of both overreaching um, uncertainty um, and certainly given the fact that this is being done by national governments that have that that, that, that have been captured by by special interest groups um, in, in in a large number of cases I'm not sure that that's going to turn things around um, as quickly or as effectively as we probably need to see it turned. Um, I just wanted your opinion on enforcement uh, of, uh, you know, as compared with uh, ink and paper works formerly and now with the uh, different uh, adoptions in, in different countries of these treaties, uh, do you f feel that uh, uh, enforcement is enhanced, or what's your view on that? Uh, say, for instance, if you have a work that comes out of a country in Europe uh, to be enforced here uh, in the United States, but it's it's not uh, ink and paper anymore. Yeah. So I, I take the question, sort of, you know, how how effective is cross border enforcement? Or Okay, um, that's really interesting. I mean, one of the things, because um, uh, I, I was kind of cognizant of the time, but one of the things that um, I think works not so well is cross-border enforcement. Um, and, and that's in far, part because we don't have a uniform system. The, the, the Hague um, uh, agreement is, is not likely to help in that regard. Um, but clearly, if it's, it's encoded or wrapped sort of technologically, then you don't need to refer to a public institution, say a court or, or even a panel, depending on the country you're in, uh, to secure enforcement of the copyright. I mean, one of the great changes that digital copyright has, has wrought is that you can have private enforcement. And, um, and to the extent that you can do that sitting in a different country, say for example, shut down uh, uh, the user's ability to read the book um, um, if the user is not willing to pay the extra dollar fifty to turn the page, um, you know, uh, to the extent that you can, um, uh, what, I'm not sure if it was Bruce Lehman or, or who it was, um, no, actually it was a, one of the, our senators that said, you know, that you, know, you should be be able to blow up a computer that has, um, you know, lots of, of infringing files on it. I mean, to the extent that it's not just the question of what is copyrightable that has been privatized, but who can enforce it? 
has also been privatized. So to the extent that that technology is protected by law, and you can't disable that technology without facing separate liability, then I think the enforcement uh, prospects go up remarkably. Um, because there's, n there's nothing more, more um, in some ways, powerful than the ability to uh, decide what the law is and enforce the law all by yourself. Uh, without any threat of of of, um, of anybody suing you anywhere, um, so I think that the, the enforcement prospects are higher in in the digital arena, um, but not because the institutions are better, but simply because they're left to the hands of owners who do have the most interest in making sure that they collect all the tolls at every stop possible. I was intrigued by your comments about the, the chilling effect, the chilling effect on users that some of these laws have. Um, and one of the ways to recalibrate the, the balance is to put some kind of chilling effect back on copyright owners or distributors of copyrighted works. Um, certainly attorney fee awards in the United States going to defendants who are successful in their litigation of a copyright case is a type of chilling effect, right? It's meant to say to copyright owners, don't overreach. When you overreach, this is what ha can happen to you. I'm curious other potentials uh, that you might consider to recalibrate that balance and put somewhat of a damper on the tendency or the temptation by copyright owners to overreach. Um, I, I think if you f my if you want a radical response, I would I would certainly move way beyond attorney fees. Um, remember that the problem is uncertainty, and how do users react to uncertainty? Um, if you are a publisher or an author, and your publisher says, and you say this is fair use. Um, and your publisher says, well, I beg to differ, um, you are more than likely going to end up paying for that use, even if it is, in fact, a legitimate fair use. So that the uncertainty, I'm not sure that simply responding um, by giving attorney fees, unless we happen to have users that are willing to go to court, repeat users of the system, so that there becomes sort of a culture that encourages users then to say, hey, you know what, um, I'm, I'm likely not going to not going to get sued. So I think how, dealing with the uncertainty to me is a far more important response than simply dealing with sort of the pecuniary gains that you might, or, or losses that, that a user might face. So um, I would do one of two things. I would have a rule that has a presumption that favors the user and says that this use is presumptively fine and that it is the owner that has to disprove that or overcome that presumption. So one of the most effective ways, and we see this not necessarily in intellectual property, we see this actually in other areas of law, where simply shifting the presumptions in making the prima facie case and rebutting uh, in dealing with burdens of proof has a really important effect in making the copyright owner stop or, or the plaintiff stop back and say, um, can I do this? Does it make sense for me to sue uh, the Girl Scouts of America, or does it make sense for me to sue this, you know, um, uh, 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 downloader? Right. I mean, what do you want to do now? Part of the problem, of course, is that um, these copyright lawsuits in the digital age are not often about money. Just like the infringers for lack of a better word, are not always doing this for money, right? So John Johansson is not really interested in, in making lots of money downloading legal sh you know, uh, files and distributing them. Right? Money is not the motive, right? So there's, there's actually a value contest that's going on. And that value is about who gets to control what I do. Right? How I access the work, how I interact with the work. And so there's a sense in which I, I really think that, that, that the attorney fees issue was just, or any kind of pecuniary response to this problem is going to be wholly ineffective. Right? Because we've got to deal with what the values are that, we're comp that are, that are uh, uh, being fought over. Um, and we have to deal with the ease with which the institutions that make these decisions um, get to hold owners responsible. I mean, you give owners a right to use the work, and then you make them prove that they're entitled to that right. And in, in no other legal regime does that work.
work quite that way, right? If I have the right to use the work, then why shouldn't the presumption favor me in the absence of any sort of clear, um, you know, um, act um, uh, that this was a willful and, and sort of deliberate attempt to undercut the economic gain that the owner would have? So I would definitely shift presumptions. I would, I would certainly make it presumptively fine for users to do any number of the things that we find. Um, um, I would make it presumptively fine for a user to circumvent a technological measure, for certainly for personal use, and some legislation does that, some does not, uh, certainly for the kinds of uses that I think are, in my words, necessarily consistent with our technological culture, right? If I forward you email or somebody sends me a cute picture taken by Walmart, I should be able to forward that to my friend to say, look at my cute child or my cute do you know, dog or whatever it might be. Um, so that I would not only think about limitations and exceptions consistent with copyright's purpose, but I would think about uses in the digital environment that are necessarily consistent with the way in which ordinary people live, right? That we forward, we share, we interact, we engage. And I think Joe's article um, on copyright's view of the, of the user is, is in, in, in part making that argument. This is a problem that has existed before the digital age. It's, it's, it's in general the way in which copyright looks at users as, as passive. Um, so those are a couple of things I would do. My real radical response would be to say, I would make this a liability rule regime. I would say every use is permissible for payment of some reasonable royalty, um, and that the copyright owner gets you know, to certainly assert that the use was an overreaching by the, by the, by the user. But the fact of the matter is if you combine the ability of users to overcome technological protection measures, the unwillingness of some users, just as a matter of, of moral interest. I don't think, I think, you know, I've got an uncle who's a starving artist and I wanna pay for every use. And you combine sort of our, the, the advertising, uh, and I use that term very loosely, by con the content industry, that you're, f you're less likely to find uh, people, even under a liability rule regime, um, willing to abuse the system. I mean, you will always find the outliers. But I suspect that there's been a great deal of exaggeration about what users, how evil users are, and how good content owners are. A uh, question to follow up on what you said. Um, how do you deal with the uh, copyright law developed a group of legal professionals or people who basically take this as a statutory law and apply it? I mean, simple example is somebody goes into a market, picks up a DVD, looks at this DVD, an attorney goes into the market, picks up a DVD, looks at it under the loop and says, ha this is, you know, bootlegged. Let's look at the store. Okay, it looks good. It's been in business for a while. We, we, we can sue them. Calls the copyright owner, says, you know, I have something for you. And, you know, the whole, the whole thing goes on. Uh, on the other hand, the same uh, practitioner would go into the small stand, you know, find out, say, okay, these guys, they don't have enough to cover, you know, whatever's going to happen, so we ain't going to touch them. So it cre this law created basically a group of practitioners who are uh, uh, going in circles around, 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 and again, you know, and uh, um, any thought on how, uh, what can be done to uh, kind of limit this practice or? Uh, so I think your question is there is sort of the, the uh, rights owners are discriminatorily en enforcing their privilege, right? They're picking. Are uh, practitioners who oh. basically are pariahing oh. in the market, you know? They're ambulance chasing, as we would say. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, one of the things in my paper that I talk about a little bit is how copyright, and, and for me, this is really sad as a copyright scholar, that copyright really is now a tort. I mean, that's, we've, that's basically what we've reduced it to. Um, and this is where ambulance chasing occurs all the time. And so your question is, should we penalize attorneys who sort of troll the marketplaces looking for infringing works um, and then call the owners and say, hey, by the way, you know, you've got a lawsuit you didn't know about? that you could bring. Um, 
you know, I'm hesitant to say that that would be an appropriate thing to do. Um, now, I, I, as a teacher, I, I tell my students all the time, you choose how you make your living. And clearly there are good ways to do this and there are bad ways to do this. Um, but I think that both because our uh, uh, liberal culture, um, our notions of, of freedom, um, um, would probably not make any kind of limitation on that kind of behavior uh, um, possible. I also think that there there are two different things going on, right? We have a wide body of law, namely tort law in particular, that really does say you are your brother's keeper, you are your neighbor's keeper to some degree, and 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 um, and we limit that typically in to to certain kinds of criminal laws. Um, or certain kinds of offenses that sort of shock the conscience and we, we expect that you would turn somebody in or report this or certainly not conceal it. Um, is bootlegging something that shocks the conscience? Should it be, <coughs> should it be the kind of violation um, or the kind of offense that we are so outraged by that we want to encourage attorneys to troll around and, and find pirated copies of things and call clients. Um, I think that becomes a judgment call that I'm not sure that we ought to make, although clearly I think that we could tinker with some of our rules of professional responsibility. We could, uh, uh, as Lydia suggests, do things with attorney fees where we think that an attorney has not represented the client's interests well. Um, but other than that, simply the, the rise of a cadre of lawyers sort of, you know, going around flea markets looking for bootleg copies of, of computer software. I mean, boy, they'd make a lot of money in, in some countries of the world that I will not name. But, um, you know, there's a lot of money to be made here, and lawyers are very good at finding where the money is. Um, so unless there's no reward in it, um, I doubt that you're going to be able to stop that kind of behavior. And it's not clear to me that it's copyrights um, responsibility to do that. I mean, we may want to do that, as I said, under different regimes, um, but it's not clear to me that, that, that that's the role of copyright. I'm not sure if that address, I, I mean, I understand the, the concern that you have. Um, I'm just not sure that it's any different in other fields where this, where this goes, uh, goes on. Where the fulfillment takes place, I mean, it can come from Omaha, it can come from Florida, who knows where, uh, you know, and they can contract for the shipment from Florida, they, can't, can, can, they can contract with, say, Germany or Australia to uh, go through the broker to buy the goods. And then at the end, the result is they received something, mm -hmm. they would never open the package, mm -hmm. which is, you know, wrapped mm -hmm. completely, and yeah. then somebody comes in and goes, oh, you know, and we become, and the law yeah. provides for the, yeah. you know, yeah. your innocent yeah. infringer, it doesn't matter, you're statutory liable, mm -hmm. and we take it from there, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I mean, to the extent that you're referring to, you know, can we manipulate the innocent in infringer defense to, to sort of uh, provide some cover for folks who sort of get, you know, illegal bootleg material and didn't know that they had bootleg material? Um, in their possession. Now, clearly, they, you know, they're, they're not authorized to, to sell that material. They're not authorized to do anything with it. They would have to bring, perhaps, a breach of contract act, some other sort of action with the, to their supplier. Um, but uh, the attorney comes, finds that you've got this bootleg stuff in your, in your store. Um, that is not a copyright infringement, right? Just sort of having it in your store. Having, you, haven't just, you haven't done anything. You haven't violated a Section 106 right. Right? Um, so you've, what you've purchased, are you saying that you've purchased these bootleg CDs in a box? You haven't opened the box, you just got it? No, you have it on your shelf. Did you copy it? You didn't copy it. You just bought a box and it was full of pirated CDs. All right, so you, you purchased it from who? Matter where, well, I mean, you have you have a recourse to go up the chain, but the fact that you have it on your shelf and it's offered for sale, Oh, that you offered it? Oh, you're a vendor? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't get that part. Okay, I thought no, no, no. you have a box of private CDs you bought, you didn't open, and it's sitting no, in no, your no, office. No, no, and you no, no, no. Was, it's, okay, it's, sorry. It's either a vendor, it's a okay. retailer, wholesaler, okay. somebody I'm sorry. who... Yeah, I, I didn't... That, that small point, um, yes, certainly changes things. I did not realize you were offering it for sale. Well, yes, then you would be an infringer. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't get that part. And yes, I mean, and so, you're, so you're, the question then is, you know, 
can you manipulate this innocent infringer defense um, as one way of limiting the ability of, a, of an owner to essentially come um, come after you, um, you know, for innocent infringer. Uh, for, and I mean, that's that's I think a possibility. The innocent infringer defense is so weak in many ways that I'm not even sure that's where you would want to go, right? For if what you want is absolute immunity for that sort of, for, I did not know that this was bootlegged. When I found out, I took it off my shelf. Why should that not be, why, why even mess with innocent infringer? Why, I mean, if you're gonna do, go that far to do it statutorily, why not just have a clear defense? That would be, I mean, but that's, that's the, the, the teacher talking. Uh, two questions I have. Um, one is, is maybe too speculative, but it was interesting your, your observation that a lot of what copyright law is now aimed at is not what we would think of as traditional authorship, which they're protecting manufactured products in particular ways. And I wonder whether, with hindsight, and that's only in hindsight, it was a bad decision to include software uh, within, the, within the copyright regime. I mean, that ship has sailed, but um, internationally. But I wonder whether, with hindsight, it would have been better to approach that under some sort of sui generis regime that was much more measured. Because I think a lot of the copyright developments with respect to what we think of as creative products look very different from um, uh, simply the sale of technology. So that's just one sort of question. Mm -hmm. Second one, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit more on uh, your, your observation, which I think is a good one, that it's amazing how many developing countries have signed up to the WIPO copyright treaty, notwithstanding lack of the technology that you would think would um, really enable them to take advantage of it. So my question is, I've always thought that copyright was the most egalitarian form of intellectual property. You don't need you know, $20 million uh, uh, to produce a written product that's protected, unlike, say, for a pharmaceutical product. So I always sell it as this is the most egalitarian form of property you can, you can have. Um, to make that work in the WIPO copyright treaty context, however, there's probably some need for technological infrastructure. And I wonder whether, uh, what your thoughts are on whether the copyright treaty should do what the patent and trademark treaties do, or, or, or patent and trademark committees have done more recently in WIPO, which is to condition the grant of rights that in theory uh, could be taken advantage of by developing countries on some degree of, of uh, uh, technical capacity building uh, and infrastructure building, and therefore transfers of cash from the developed world to the developing world to enable that infrastructure to actually um, be built up in the first place. Good question, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, including soft, certainly once we began down the path of software protection um, under copyright, we were clearly opening this up. And, and we see this in the WIPA Broadcasting Treaty where it really is a sort of a, 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 of what some folks are referring to as a horizontal expansion, right? That it's new actors, new rights, and new um, um, uh, beneficiaries, right? So broadcasting organizations become all of a sudden part and parcel um, of our copyright corpus. And I think we saw this certainly in the copyright context with the ex exclu uh, uh, inclusion um, of software. And, and looking back, I, I think I would say, yeah, I, I think that we should have gone with a sui generis regime. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the WIPO Broadcasting Treaty for this reason. I, I think that we are, if there's any hope of sort of regaining some corpus to, to what we think of as copyright, um, and maybe that's a conversation we should be having as scholars and as practitioners and as judges. Is this a, a, a system that has outlived its utility? Um, given the way in which we have we have expanded it, um, and given the fact that counter movements have been able to slow and in some places completely derail, say in the, in the case of, of the substantive patent law treaty, but but that's not clear that that's not going to boomerang back either. So I, I think that the notion of of, of having a, a sui generis regime is actually important for two reasons. For structural reasons, because it's not consistent with what we would normally think of as copyrightable works, notwithstanding um, um, you know, our, our position on it in the US, um, even, you know, prior to, to, to TRIPS and the, the, the WIPO copyright treaties. But also, I think, to give us time to experiment. If, in fact, it is a case that, that, that some copyright, our notion of copyright is outdated, that this is not about originality and fixation, 
And it's not about authorship and protecting um, the integrity of the author and the ability of the author to recoup economic gain. If, in fact, that system ought to be replaced either by uh, what Jerry refers to, Jerry Reichman refers to as a liability rule regime, whether it ought to be replaced by a system of levies entirely, um, then maybe we ought to be thinking hard and long about what our alternatives are and what we lose by shifting that radically. But I think that when we move especially to technologies of the sort that we have today, starting with, with computer software and then moving to networks and to the regulation of, of OSPs and, and, um, and where intermediaries are no, no, no longer just agents but they, it is in fact technology, um, and where even originality is not necessarily um, a human person breathing life into, into a creative expression, but it could be uh, something done almost entirely technologically, um, that these are some hard questions that we, we, we ought to think about. So I, but I would certainly, for structural reasons and um, because I think it gives us room to experiment with sp subspecies of works that, that are partly creative, partly not, that we would get much better results um, before automatically integrating them into the into the copyright into the copyright system. I mean, you know, in in, in thinking about my talk and in, in working um, on it, it, it really did strike me how very little conversation we have, even in WIPO, about copyright. And it's it's remarkable. I mean, you could you could go through WIPO documents and go through uh, 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 you know the standing committee documents. And all of it is about how do we balance out the competing interests. It's not how do we encourage creativity. It's not about how do we encourage dissemination. It not, the creative enterprise is completely unregulated. Um, and this, I think, ought to trouble us um, um, as scholars and certainly as, as purists, copyright purists, if, if we think of ourselves that way. Um, as to the second question about uh, technological capacity, uh, you know, this this is a question that is that is fairly complex because, as you well know, WIPO's technical assistance programs have come under severe criticism in the last gosh, particularly in the last five years. Um, why? Because technical assistance really has been let's draft the law and give it to your legislature to implement. That has been the extent of technical assistance, um, and it is striking to me. Um, the lack of attention that we have paid, both in the TRIPS agreement and in the WIPO Digital Treaties, to the uh, Burn Appendix, which has been something I've been campaigning about for a while. Right? If you look at the WIPO uh, Digital Treaties, they both say, you know, um, or the TRIPS agreement and the WCT, both say, um, you know, you're going to ratify this and the appendix. Nobody has talked about compulsory licensing of digital works. Not a word has come out about this. Um, and that's not unsurprising because that's a fairly complicated thing to think about, especially since we can't even figure out whether libraries can do digital interlibrary loan, right? So, so I mean, there, there's a lot that we have not even touched on. And that's why I think that the debates, the, and looking back 10 years over the life of these treaties, we are not really talking about copyright. Right? We're talking about manufacturers of hardware and their relationship to manufacturers of software and content providers is a very fertile playing field because it gives both of these parties the legal, uh, le the legitimacy and the legal leverage to say we're justified in fixing our hardware in this system. We're justified in moving from an open system to a closed system. We're justified in putting uh, controls on your PC or on your DVD player. Um, so all of the things that you might not otherwise have reason to do. Um, I like to say that the WIPO Copyright Treaty has given incentives um, to creators of technology, not necessarily creators of content, and, and clearly the literature, I think, s s supports that, that there, we assume away the incentive problem and focus on this. So technological capacity in developing countries, what, what would be needed? You're talking about, you know, looking at the last sort of UN development report, it's fascinating to me that, that least developed countries have ratified these treaties. And if you look at the legislation in many of these countries, they are worse. 
than the, than the DMCA. You would be amazed. And you know clearly, since um, most of the population doesn't know an if, what, an, what is an effective technological protection measure, um, you know clearly that this is not originating from these countries. And so, but the question is for those countries, so I think that for the least developed countries, I would say, I wouldn't even say link it to capacity building. Absolutely not. I would say give them 20 years to decide what sort of um, infrastructure um, they're going to go with. Because obviously the, the choices now are not about copyright or no copyright. It's about open or closed systems. It's, it's about you know what kind of um, um, pl government procurement in, in the area of software you're going to be using. Are you doing open source? Are you not? It's much more about technological choices. Um, and those choices are going to affect the kind of architecture and the kind of infrastructure these countries go with. One of the things that we're seeing is that by signing the WIPO Copyright Treaty and the WIPO uh, Performance of Phonograms Treaty and these free trade agreements, there actually are choices being made about the technologies that will be acceptable for use in these countries. And that, I think, is, is a really important thing. For developing countries that are on the cusp, that are a little richer, more robust, um, I would certainly link it to some capacity building beyond just drafting legislation, but looking at real choices. Right? The whole WIPO development agenda is about rethinking what the institution is supposed to be doing in shaping not only uh, the creation of technology, but in shaping the ability of, of different regions of the world to embrace and, and, and actually assimilate that technology, much of which is not happening um, under those activities today. So I would be even more radical than that. I think that's a great starting point, but I would push it to an absolute moratorium um, for the least developed countries, um, and especially to the extent that what these choices are, are setting the countries in a particular technological path with software and hardware and internet media, uh, intermediaries, et cetera. And this is sort of related to the, the last question, so maybe this will um, kind of be a nice segue. Um, you know, I was really struck by your statement that uh, copyright's relationship to technology is no longer neutral and passive. Uh, and I was struck by that on a number of fronts. One, just by how accurate that statement, I think, is. Uh, the fact that these treaties really are so overtly about technology, and a lot of the cases are all about technology, not about really access, but the technology itself. Um, and also by kind of the suggestion that this is sort of an inevitable part of copyright's future, mm -hmm. right? That having crossed that line, right, this is going to be part of our future discussion about mm -hmm. what copyright is about mm -hmm. uh, or about creativity or all these other issues. Um, and that I find very chilling, right? This idea that, uh, you know, copyright law will be sort of, you know, driving our technology policy in some way. Uh, and so my question is, um, what form do you think this discussion will take in the future, right? Having crossed that line, uh, do you anticipate, um, you know, in the international arena, uh, ever more efforts to combine technology and all the rest? Uh, and specifically, can you think of any uh, limiting factors um, to this, right? Is there, what, what's the countervailing pressure? Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of consumer rights and uh, other issues being not so effective. Uh, is there something about competition or other areas that will be successful in checking this? Thanks. That's a, a really a great question, and and um, it's the it's the one thing that I'm I'm really excited about, which is the possibility. And to answer the question, the possibility um, there are possibilities for competition law only because, of course, the the, the, the way the technology is unraveling, right? Is, is not only do you have this choice between open and closed systems, but once you move to a closed system, then that definitely raises some antitrust, anti-competition issues, which I think technology providers have not quite thought through. Now. The challenge, of course, is that historically, we've figured this out in patents. It has never really quite been the issue for copyright, and it will become more and more of an issue for copyright as the technological choices become you know, fewer and fewer. Um, and I think uh, technology providers right now are saying, gosh, you know, copyright, it, you know, we've never had an antitrust, an, you know, sort of competition law based limit. Um, and so because it is, you know, nobody can stop me from putting you know, a bomb at my door or from putting sort of 
triple steel bar gates in my, around my house, if it's mine, this notion that it's my property and I can do whatever I want with it, there is, I think, an implicit um, uh, um, uh, take um, uh, on the part of the industry that uh, the application of competition rules to to copyright in qua techno technology qua copyright is is going to be really limited or difficult to figure out. And I think they're right that it will be difficult. I don't think it will be impossible because I think eventually, when even governments begin to realize this is problematic, um, there's going to be a great a, a real issue about that. Um, but but what excites me even more is the possibility that in trying to get harmonization through the vehicle of technology, right? By saying everybody do TPMs, everybody you know, engage in this sort of control um, fest. Um, what we thought we would get is complete harmonization. We thought we'd have a uniform sort of really cohesive uh, jurisprudence about DRMs and about anti-circumvention and about rights management and all this stuff. And instead, countries are splintering in all kinds of directions legally. So you've got unfair competition law, you've got criminal, you've got civil, you have administrative procedures and courts and institutions and, and explicit limitations and exceptions and some doing it under a bundle of sort of open-ended terms. And this, I think, is wonderful because it disrupts the perception of coherence and shows us how entirely uncoherent it is. Um, and it suggests that given the, what I call the fractionalization of implementation, combined with the lack of uniformity on exhaustion, combined with the very still real possibility of parallel imports, and now that we can do them in bites and bits and, and wrapped up parcels, you will get jurisdictions that will say, hey, reverse engineer. Go ahead and reverse engineer. I think that is going to hold enormous possibilities because as the gentleman asked about enforcement, just like you can sit in Tanzania and control whether I read your novel in the US by simply asking me to provide a key and, and if you don't or pay me a fee and if you don't, I just sort of blow up your computer, in the same way you are likely going to find havens. What we're gonna to begin to refer to as technological technology havens, right? where it will be possible to decrypt, reverse engineer, do things for interoperability purposes, and you will see in some ways, I suspect, a race to the bottom in those jurisdictions. I find it very interesting. If you look at the list of 32 countries on the WTO's least, uh, 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 countries that are exempted from TRIPS, none of them are countries with large populations. So any country that has sort of a really significant population where the spread of that kind of freedom would really mean that we would get gray market goods in technological um, um, and technologically protected content. Um, there's clearly a, a very structured way in deciding which countries get out of the system, which countries um, get in. So I think there's a lot of possibility, and, and I think that that's where we're going to see the debate going. Um, efforts to make sure that we don't get technology havens, for example. Efforts to very quickly try to regroup the way in which the WCT and WPPT is being implemented. Um, and so it's not going to be national at all. It will be very much international. And because we cannot get consensus on these exhaustion rules, we cannot get consensus on parallel importation, and because there's no way to uniformly implement this now, um, I think that fractionalization is going to become a central organizing force for what the next round, um, I think, will be. out to the right here and then we'll reconvene with our panel, our first policy panel. But I would like to again very much thank Professor Akedaji for coming here and speaking to us.